Good evening, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. A couple of announcements before we begin. Excuse me. <clears throat> I will be preaching at the Healing Place on February 19th, the 11 o'clock service. Also, uh, on YouTube, uh, there is a video that I've done with another pastor from the area, and it just aired, I think, Tuesday, but you can still see it. It's Larry Raglan, and it's the big picture. And then there was another thing I needed to tell you about, which is, you can tell me. You forgot too. Ah, yes, we want to remind you that we're going to be starting the John study right after uh, the, the Zechariah study, which is thir chapter 13 today, and Lord willing, next week will be chapter 14. Then we'll go right into John with an introduction. I'm really looking forward to doing that. So let me give you a little bit of in the news what's been happening this week. This is of January 25th, 2023. The first, the first category would be the New World Order. And as we get there, obviously, maybe you've been following it, but the uh, World Economic Forum has happened this past week. And this article headline says, World Economic Forum urges gathered elites to, quote, master the future. Why do people think that it's creepy that a group of select human beings have gathered in Davos, Switzerland to shape the agenda of the entire planet? That's right. Could it be because many of the attendees truly believe that they are saving the planet? As he opened the 2023 annual meeting, WEF head Klaus Schwab urged the gathered elitists to, quote, master the future. Elon Musk quickly tweeted the following in response. How is WEF Davos even a thing, he said. Are they trying to be the boss of the earth? The answer is yes. So if they are the ones that will be the masters of the future, who will be the ones that they're subjugating? I think that we all know the answer to that question. Over the years, Schwab has made so many controversial statements, but the mainstream media just keeps apologizing for him again and again. So why is that? Well, speaking of controversial statements, something that John Kerry, you remember him, John Scary, just said during his speech at Davos is really raising a lot of eyebrows. Kerry actually had the gall to say that those gathered in Davos are, quote, select human beings, and that their mission to save the planet is almost extraterrestrial. The billionaire politician who married into the wealthy Heinz family, as in ketchup, he pra heaped praise on those who attended the meeting in the Swiss ski town, saying how extraordinary that we human beings, select human beings, are able to sit in a room and come together and actually talk about saving the planet. The gall of this guy is unbelievable. Quote, I mean, it's so almost extraterrestrial, he said, to think about saving the planet. If you said that to most people, they would think you're just crazy, tree-hugging, lefty, liberal, do-good. He said, but really, that's who we are. Has Gary gone, complete, Gary gone completely nuts? It's frightening to think that this guy almost became the President of the United States. Sadly, the truth is that the globalists that are gathered in Davos are really not elite at all. The global elite track, uh, tackling the world's greatest problems, including gender inequality at the Davos summit, are fueling a surge, listen to this, in prostitution in the Swiss resort town. Demand for sex work skyrockets every year at the meeting of world leaders and business tycoons who jet in from all over the world to rub shoulders with each other. Escorts are booked into the same hotels as high-powered bosses and their employees during the five-day summit, which started on January 16th. So how does renting them for sex empower these young women? It's being reported that escort services are fully booked for the week because there's such a raging demand. Switzerland media outlets are reporting that escort services are fully booked and it will continue to be booked. Erotic entertainer provider Araga told the daily newspaper 20 Minute Men that diplomats and businessmen have hired their escorts for themselves and their employees, just think about this, to party in Davos hotels. Some also book escorts for themselves and their employees, it went on to say, to party in the hotels and then after. The same guys that are treating young women like disposable sex toys are also the ones that we're being told will save the world. I don't think so. Um, one woman working as an escort told a newspaper she regularly sees an American who visits Switzerland multiple times a year and is among the 2,700 conference attendees. Liana, which is her name, charges uh, $760 an hour, $2,500 for the whole night, plus travel expenses. $750 is a lot of money. Unfortunately, no matter how much we criticize the globalists and their agenda, their agenda keeps getting moved forward. In fact, the leaders of the United States, Mexico, and Canada just released the Declaration of North America. That appears to be the biggest step toward, towards a North American integration that we've seen in years. 
Can you see the, the world shrinking into a one world economy, a one world political system? All these things are some of the baby steps towards it, maybe even bigger steps than that. Today, President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador and President Joseph Biden and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau met in Mexico City, this was last week, for the 10th North American Leaders Summit. The leaders are determined to, to fortify their, their region's security, prosperity, sustainability, and here it is, inclusiveness through commitments across six pillars. One, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Two, climate change and the environment. Three, competitiveness. Four, migration and development. Five, health. And six, regional security. So we're watching this, this conglomeration of, of nations all over the planet. The globalists want us to stay deeply divided and fighting one another. That's why you see the media tearing apart America. Our world is changing so rapidly now, and we're headed into such perilous times, as Paul tells us. The elite would have us believe that they know exactly what is best for all of us and that a much better world is just around the corner if we just do what they say. Obviously, you can see they're setting us up for a one world leader. The question is, do you believe them? Well, I don't know about you, but I don't intend to follow the advice of any elitist that thinks that it's a good idea to rent young women to satisfy their twisted sexual desires. On that same line, let me go a little bit further and tell you another thing that's happened at this global meeting. The global elites plan for the next pandemic. They're already planning, planning for it at uh, Davos with digital vaccination tracking. You heard me, right? Digital vaccination tracking. What's that? Well, ever since the pandemic event, along with the lockdowns and the attempts to introduce vaccine passports, you remember that, establishment representatives have been far more open about their agenda and their, their uh, intentions for the future. So what they decided, and I'll just paraphrase this, what they decided, their hopes are to put in a system, a worldwide system of a vaccination tracker. Everyone that gets vaccinated gets tracked. By whom? Well, obviously the global elite are going to set it up. Now, if that doesn't sound to you like some type of marking system or even the preliminary for a marking system, I don't know what does. The average vaccine takes at least 10 years to study for safety and long-term side effects. The COVID vaccines were developed and administered in less than a year under emergency author authorization. We still don't know what's going on with the vaccines and the repercussions that it causes because no one is having a case study on it. Borla, which is one of the men, admits that the biggest challenge in the enforcement of mandates and widespread vaccination was public, public skepticism. And of course it is because the public is, does not trust vaccines. Whether you want to be on the side of vaccines or not, the public generally does not trust them. There's just not enough information to tell us what happens after somebody gets vaccinated. And we've been told lies. And I know that this may sound strange and maybe even people might want to take me off of the internet for this, but this is a fact. It's not my opinion. The fact is that we were told vaccinations, you'll never get COVID. That's not true. We know that's not true. So that's one of the reasons why the, the public is skeptic. Now, again, I'll probably be scrubbed for saying something like that, but it's not me saying it. This is all over the news. This is all of what people are saying because we just don't know. The fact is, not opinion, the fact is we have no follow-up to all this stuff that's happening. And what we've been told, I mean, we were told to wear masks, not to wear masks. And so we can't trust the science, even though Fauci said he was science, but he can't be trusted. And so this is what the global elite know. They know that the world is skeptical and they want to eliminate that. They'll do that whatever they can. Davos was a meeting to be able to address that. Now, how can we get the world in line with getting vaccination uh, passports? And so I just wanted to inform you that that's coming down the line. So the myth of overpopulation was also another thing. Much believed, much beloved by the, by the population control experts, environmental activists and progressives, they've taken another blow recently. They believe we're overpopulated. They believe that we need to cut down on the, on the people that are on the planet. They actually, one of them actually was hinted at saying that it would be good if another pandemic came and killed off millions of people. That is atrocious, that's unbelievable. But that's what's happening with the global elites. Now, let me just tell you that we are in a crisis in America. In America, for the first time ever last year, we are having less babies born than people die. Our population is decreasing. Um, when, I t when I tell people and they ask me about my father's, uh, my father's family and my mother's family, my dad's mom had eight kids. My mother's mom had nine kids. They, they roll their eyes like their eyes bulge out because they can't believe that. Because we live in a society today where it's an average in America of 1.2. I don't know how you have a 0.2 kid, but it's 1.2 children. The reality is that we soon will arrive in a day where nobody is left alive who remembers what it was like to live before the sexual revolution. It's one of the things that's hurting our population. Barring a few religious communities 
who still adhere to the old ways. And when memory turns into history, it produces a loss of knowledge that, if not passed down, creates an entirely new society, one that cannot be fixed by policy and has forgotten any other way. And my friends, unfortunately, we are at the brink of that right now. Let me give you a little bit about Israel. And Israel is really in a, in a turmoil, and I wanted to show you just a little bit about it. That's Benjamin Netanyahu. Israelis conservatives create a new fight. Benjamin Netanyahu is once again Prime Minister of Israel after 20 months of being absent from office. Backed up by what many consider Israel's most conservative government yet, um, res recently Israel's new National Security Minister, Itamar ben Guv, visited the Temple Mount briefly, and in doing so, he enraged the Palestinian officials. The status quo says that only Arabs are allowed to pray on the Temple Mount, though anyone is, a, is a, allowed to visit. Yet ben Guv, a mere presence on the Temple Mount, without praying, let me remind you, and within the limits of the status quo, caused the backlash. While the Palestinians pressure fellow Arab states to push back against Israel, Gulf states, UAE, Bahrain, continue to work to maintain the Abraham Accords, originally brokered by Netanyahu in his previous administration. They do this in part as a counter against Iran's actions in the region. Iran is a rogue nation. Even Muslim nations don't trust Iran. The situation in the Holy Land and on the Temple Mount continues to be precarious. And Bible prophecies indicate that events in and around Jerusalem will soon profoundly impact the balance of power in the Middle East and Europe. You've been hearing that in our Zechariah study. You're going to hear it again tonight, how nations will surround Jerusalem uh, in the millennium, uh, for one time, by the way, and right before it, at Armageddon. So Jerusalem has been a hot spot, and it continues to be a hot spot, even in our lives, especially in our lives. Let me give you a little bit about the economy. Not that that's good news either. Uh, enormous wave of bankruptcies and layoffs during the early stages of 2023. Now in 2022, uh, towards the end of it, I told you about the bankruptcies and the layoffs, but they're continuing to come in spite the fact that the feds are raising interest rates to try to curb inflation, in, in spite of the fact that, that all of the political pundits say that uh, we're not headed into, we're not gonna stay in an inflation, it's temporary. Listen to this. So right now we are witnessing so much turmoil in so many different sectors of our economy, the housing market is crashing. The cryptocurrency industry has imploded. The tech industry is laying off workers at an extremely frightening pace. And most important retailers are heading into bankruptcy. Uh, our economy is in a huge trouble. Microsoft is one of the wealthiest companies in the entire world. Executives have decided that it has become necessary to lay off 10,000 workers. The software company confirmed Wednesday it's reducing workforce by 10,000 people through the end of the third quarter of 2023's fiscal year. Is any job in the private sector truly safe? Some of the biggest names in the, in the retail industry are plunging into bankruptcy. On Tuesday, it was Party City's turn. Uh, bankruptcy filing for Bed Bath & Beyond has become likely. Uh, so many brick and mortar retailers are really struggling right now, and many of them are blaming competition from the internet retailers, such as Amazon. But if Amazon is doing so well, then why did they start, off, start laying off approximately 18,000 workers this past Wednesday, yesterday? Prior to this week, more than 25,000 tech industry workers have already been laid off this year. More than 101 tech companies around the world will have laid off 26,000 employees so far in 2023. In the United States, 22,400 employees, employees were fired. So they laid them off from tech companies, and it's a trend right now. It's continuing since 2022, when 154,500 workers were fired from over 1,000 tech companies around the world, according to the data. But at least the tech industry is in far better shape than the cryptocurrency industry, isn't it? Or is it? Let me just give you a couple of things that happened in the past 10 days. One, Genesis Global Capital is laying the groundwork for bankruptcy filing. That's a cryptocurrency, one of the big ones. Two, Crypto.com be laying off 20% of its workforce. Three, this is just the past week. Coinbase is to cut about a fifth of its workforce. Four, the founder of cryptocurrency exchange Bitslato has actually been arrested for laundering money. That company's going down. On top of everything else, the Saudis appear to be poised for a major move that could literally change everything. Saudi Arabia is open to discussion about trading currencies other than the U.S. dollar. Now, the U.S. dollar is the reserve currency of the world. If you want to buy oil and you're, you're in China and the Chinese government wants to buy oil, they have to buy it in American dollars. But Saudis are starting to say that we're not really trusting the American dollar anymore. That has massive implications for America. 
uh, dominance of the dollar is one of the only things that keeps our system afloat. At this point, just about everything is moving in the wrong direction for the United States economy. A lot of the experts assume that we will just suffer through a temporary recession and then things will eventually return to normal. Well, I wish that was true. Unfortunately, our entire, our entire system is starting to crack, starting to crumble all around us. And those that are currently running things are not going to be able to put it back together again. My opinion, I'm not sure they want to. I think it plays right into the elite's hands. I think when economies around the world falter and fail, I think that's when the elites will have their best crisis ever and they'll be able to take control. And believe me, they will because people will panic. Let me give you a little bit more in the news. Uh, I put this under war because it's probably, it probably needs to be there. This came out this week. Today's alliances are as predicted by the prophets of the Bible. The prophecies of Ezekiel and Daniel tell us that war is coming against Israel and what nations and people and what people groups will be involved in that war. Make, made over 2,000 years ago, 2,600 years ago, it lines up closely to the current alignment of nations that we're seeing emerging today. The biblical prophets predicted that in the end days, there would be four main superpowers or, or spheres of power in four geographical regions in relation to Israel. They are the kings of the north, the kings of the south, the kings of the east, and the kings of the west. Revelation 13. The prophets further predicted that there would be alliances formed between some of these things following into those kings. These kings may include some of the following nations and their leaders. The king of the north, Russia, Turkey, Syria, uh, and uh, Lebanon, Hezbollah, Hamas. Kings of the south, traditionally in the Bible, it was referring to Egypt. This king will most likely include 57 Islamic nations that make up the Organization of Islamic Conference. They could also include Indonesia. The kings of the east, China, and other Asian nations may include North Korea, depending on the final alliances. Kings of the West, called the beast of the revived Roman Empire. This king will most likely come out of what is today called the European Union and may include parts of the old Ottoman Empire. Kings of the North and the East, Daniel 11, Ezekiel 38. BRICS fits into that. The BRIC bloc originally brought together four of the world's largest emerging economies, representing over 40% of the world's population and 25% of the global GDP. Brazil, Russia, BRICS, India, China, and South Africa are its current members today. They're known as BRICS, a letter from each one of their names. But Argentina, Algeria, Bangladesh, Egypt, Iran, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Mexico, Nigeria, Sudan, Syria, Pakistan, and Venezuela have also expressed interest in joining the BRICS organization. The, their goal is the establishment of a multipolar world order. Kings of the South, Daniel 11. We're told the kings of the South and the kings of the North will not only come against each other, but will also come against Israel and attempt to wipe it off the face of the earth. We have OPEC as part of that. OPEC, 1960, was formed by Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Iraq, Kuwait, and Iran. Today, OPEC includes, you ready? Algeria, Congo, Ecuador, Equatorial, Guinea, Gab Gabon, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Libya, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Venezuela. They claim to own about four-fifths of the world's petroleum, but only two-fifths of the world's population and provides the commodities under which the banner of economic development run. Then there's OIC, OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. 57 nations are in that one. I won't re re read them off to you. Then there's the Kings of the East, Jeremiah 25, Revelation 13, the European Union, and aka the revived Roman Empire. First three members of the ancient Roman Empire were Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg. These same three members were the first to join the European Union in 1948. Today, the number of members stands at 28. The European Union is very adamant that a new world order must be formed. And you have the G20 and the G8, all these things that we hear about every day. Well, the governance for, is for global economy. That's what the G20 and G8 are all about, global economy. They, want to, they, want, they were one of the first to state a global crisis, I'm quoting, requires a global solution. And we know that that's going exactly what's going to happen in the first three years of tribulation. There's going to be crisis everywhere. And obviously, someone's going to come about and lead it, which is the Antichrist. So what about the New World Order? Today, the United Nations is the, at the forefront of the efforts to institute a one-world government. So too, apparently, are many in the United States. George H. Bush, in September of 1990s, spoke of the need for a New World Order. Bill Clinton not only agreed, but dramatically explained that upon Bush's need, he, in his speech in Berlin in 2008, Barack Obama said, quote, I am a fellow citizen of the world. In this new world order, 
will have a global citizenship. We will join in a new global partnership. Obviously, this goes beyond political lines and party lines. We're watching this happen at, all over our planet and in multiple decades. Uh, we must come together to save the planet. We need a globalized world. What do you think climate change is all about? It's not just about money. It's about bringing the entire world together under one. People of the world, this is our time, they say. We must answer our destiny and remake the world once again. Henry Kissinger stated that Obama is primed to create a new world order. In March 2022, Joe Biden said there is going to be a new world order. Not only are they wishing for it anymore, Biden's making a statement. And that say, he said that must be led by the United States. This is the worst thing the United States would ever do. Pope Francis believes that our planet is overpopulated, that something needs to be done to rectify that. And if fully behind efforts to, so call, uh, to do so via pharmaceutical methods, the Catholic Muslim Interfaith Council, created by Pope Francis, announced the building of a new Christian headquarters which combines a mosque and a church in its quest for a new world order, one of many steps he has taken to establish a one world religion. So we're watching things happen that's right down the line for Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Lamentations even has part of it. And we know that Zechariah does, and of course Revelation. Then there's the depopulation agenda, Agenda 21 and 2030. Both of those agendas espouse plans to depopulate the world's population by 2030. Perhaps as much, and listen, I'm not making this up, as 95%. No wonder why they call themselves elitists. They're going to wipe out everybody else. According to the statement from the initial, for the initial era of Echo 92 Earth Charter, quote, present vast overpopulation now far beyond the world carrying capacity cannot be answered by future reductions in the birth rate due to sterilization and abortion but must be met in the present must be met in the present by the reduction of numbers presently existing this must be done by whatever means necessary i don't know about you but uh, if you're in alabama just drive down one of our roads if you look for, to the left or the right you're going to see massive amounts of forest and land that's not inhabited it's it's a gigantic lie that we are overpopulating the world. A gigantic lie. According to the Bible, the prophecies are firing in rapid succession, like the final fireworks display on a July 4th. Leviticus 26 says, And if you walk contrary unto me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues and famines and pestilence upon you. Revelation 6, 8. One quarter of the world's people will be killed by war, by famine, and by plagues. Revelation 9, 21. They will not give up their pharmaceuticals or their drugs. Their destiny is taking is the lake burning with fire. So what's the conclusion of this? Well, Joel tells us in Joel chapter 3, verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of, of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Zephaniah, the great day of the Lord is near. It's near and hastens greatly. And the final thought, the stage for Jesus' return is being set. Prophecy continues to unfold in an escalating pattern as foretold by the Hebrew prophets. The season of the birth pains are here right now. They're burgeoning and they're not going away. Time is short. Yeshua HaMashiach is coming. Jesus our Messiah. Be sure you have salvation in Jesus and keep busy reaching the lost because that's what's happening today. And it's coming very, very fast. As we continue on that, hand in hand with those prophecies is about a persecuted church. Jesus says it will be persecuted in the end times. A recent report ranking countries oppressing Christians gave North Korea the worst score ever recorded. In addition, every country in the Middle East is listed <laughs> excuse me, as persecuting Christians, except for Israel. Estimates the number of Christians living in North Korea range from 13,000 to 400,000. It's difficult to determine as the current regime classifies <laughs> I'm not getting sick, I promise you, religious uh, activities as a political crime. If discovered by the authorities, Christians and believers are instantly put into camps as political prisoners where conditions are atrocious or they're killed on the spot. Open Doors estimates that 70,000 Christians are held in North Korean prison camps right now. According to Asia News, during Kim Jong, Kim Tu Jong's administration, Kim Jong Un's father, all non-foreign Catholic priests were, were executed and Protestant leaders who do not announce their faith were purged as American spies. From 1948 to the mid-1950s under the rule of Kim Tu-sung, all churches were closed. North Korean citizens cannot attend services. The Bible is reported to have been banned in North Korea. Christians are arrested or executed for possessing or selling the book. No European or North American countries were on the list, while every country in the Middle East is on the list persecuting Christians, except Israel. 
Northeastern Africa was the worst region for, for Christians with Somalia, Somalia, number two, Eritrea, number four, Sudan, number 10, as persecuting Christians, Libya, number five, leading the pack. Also in the Middle East was Yemen, uh, ranked as second worst. In Yemen, it's illegal to convert from Islam to Christianity. You will kill, be killed on the spot. Third on the open doors list was Somalia. This is imams and mosques and uh, madrasas state publicly that there is no room for Christianity. Christians must be wiped out. Nearly half of all Nigeria's 217 million inhabitants identify as Christians, but the country is, a, is currently undergoing an agenda of enforced Islamization. If you do not convert, you're, you, you, you are killed. 5,014 murders of Christians in 2022 alone. Christians in Pakistan, second-class citizens. Christians in Pakistan are number seven, by the way. Iran is number eight on the list. Despite having 6,000 churches and 380,000 to 1.5 million Christians in Iran, they are, tra they are treated as second-class citizens. They are monitored and face, and face social stigmas all over the country. In addition, 2.53% of China's billion population uh, self-identify as Christians. There are more Christians in China than there are communists in China. Uh, never, nonetheless, they are also persecuting Christians. So persecution is going on. It's another sign of the last days. Here's one for you. This is under religion. Biden's new rules would discriminate against faith-based charities. Christians are not being killed in America. We're being starved out of our incomes. We're being starved out of our businesses. We're being forced to try to adhere to government standards. Nine federal agencies have announced a proposed will rule to change that would not back Trump era protections for faith-based organizations against discrimination by federal government. Um, so we know that these agencies, Department of Education, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Agriculture, Agency for International Development, Department of Housing, and it goes on, Department of Urban Development, Department of Justice, Department of Labor, Department of Veterans Affairs, Department of Health and Human Services, have enacted this rule that makes that sexual orientation discrimination will not go. If you receive one cent of federal aid, you'll be shut down. The conflict also is the state declares the marketplace, the public square, to be a secular zone. There is no such thing as having private uh, religious, religious convictions in your business or in, believe this or not, in any church organization that hires people. The Biden administration is putting its thumb on the side of the secularization of the federal government by rolling back areas where religious entities might engage in more robust black practices. So what is it saying? Well, President Trump was our, was our friend in this, in this, in this uh, respect. You may fault him for other things, but he allowed religious organizations and, and made actually a, a, um, a statement uh, and actually signed it into law the fact that religious organizations cannot be, cannot be refused federal funding because they have convictions about who they hire. That has been rolled back right now by the Biden administration. One can imagine imprisonment in Imagine prison ministries, drug rehabilitation programs that include Bible study or soup kitchens that provide a free sermon with dinner, refusing to fundamentally redesign their faith-based ministry to obtain government funding. They have to rewrite their mission statements so that they can be inclusive. This is what they're forcing. It's almost as Hitlerian. It is Hitlerian. The power to grant or deny a wide range of permissible religious accommodations will remain in the, in the uh, stingy talons of the Biden administration. He's calling all the shots right now. It requires faith-based organizations can conduct themselves in a way as a secular organization. This would also harm faith-based adoption providers who only place children with married man-woman couples. That's going out the window now. Women shelters who refuse to admit gender-confused biological males or a religious hospital that refuses to perform gender transition procedures. Can you imagine? It's absolutely unbelievable. Instead of targeting and pursuing and punishing people living out their faith through service to others, we should be making it easier for churches and other faith-based organizations to help flip the Americans in need. And that's exactly who does it, faith-based organizations. Along with that, let me give you this one that came up under moral decay. There's the word woman. The Cambridge Dictionary undefines men and women. Uh, they are going to go the same way as Webster. After 813 years, the second oldest English-speaking university has reinvented itself as an institution devoted to unlearning. Users of the Cambridge Advanced Learning Dictionary awoke this week to find the dictionary had added strange definitions of man and woman to appease transgender ideologies. Cambridge University now defines woman as an adult who lives and identifies as female, though they may have been said to have a different sex at birth. 
Uh, the dictionary now defines man as an adult who lives and identifies as a male, though they may, they may have had a, a said to have a different sex at birth. Cambridge is mimicking the wokeness of other dictionaries, again, like Ma Merriam-Webster, which added a definition of female as having gender identity that is the opposite of male in July 2022. The dictionary modifications followed closely on the nomination hearings of Associate Supreme Court Justice Ketanja Brown-Jackson, who infamously refused to answer the question, what is a woman? But I relevantly point out that she is not a biologist. If you don't know what a woman is, you don't deserve to be on any high court. Merriam-Webster was happy to provide cover for Brown-Jackson by changing the definition of female. But when they did so, they put pressure on other dictionaries to make similar changes. Cambridge, the, despite the best efforts, Cambridge cannot erase the fact that they now define men as women. The last part of Cambridge's, uh, Cambridge's contra contrived definition says, may have been said to have a different sex at birth. It is a special ridicule because normal people don't and shouldn't talk this way. Proper editing would pair these 11 words to two, though he is a male is what it would say. What's a, what is a different sex from female? Well, there are only two. So the process of elimination leaves us with male. These people say a person has a certain sex because they recognize that the person is that sex and it is tr a truth so self-evident that there's no point of living. Alas, the power brokers of our era of insanity deny that there are two sexes, that the sexes have corresponding physical characteristics and that sex cannot change over time. So such confused definitions are only what our culture deserves. Cambridge's new definition of woman is not a definition so much as propaganda. Woman, that's the word, has lost so much of its meaning because it's lost some of its clarity. It's quite literally the undefinition of woman. What, if, what is the point of a dictionary if it defines, if its definitions are unfixed, if they're floating, if words can mean everything and nothing at any given moment, if a passing emotion supersedes the authority of a printed and published volume, or alternately, what is the point of a dictionary that doesn't understand the fixed meaning of words? Who can use such a possible dictionary? What can, what can help anyone when they're looking up a word? I'd like to change the name of the Cambridge Dictionary to the Ever-Floating Political Cambridge Dictionary. So that's in the news tonight. I wish I could give you, and there's great news all over. The thing I'm giving you is news that's correlating to prophecy. And so prophecy is definitely something that's giving us an eyeball look, an open, open-eyed look and what's happening in our world and how it fits into the prophecy. The uh, Bible talks about men loving men, talks about their lust burning one for another. This is the reason I have to give you this in the news. Not because I want to, not because it's something that's pleasant to hear, but because we are in track for what's going on in that biblical prophecy. All right.